Is it on? It is on. As if by magic, Dale. I greet you in the strong name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I greet those of you that are online with us. The Lord bless you. Uh, If you haven't ever been here, uh, this will be new to you. But I'm going to invite you to stand up and greet somebody that is far away from you or near you. Either way. Would you just take a few moments here and uh, as the church, greet one another. I greet you. The Lord bless you this morning as the Holy Spirit receives our worship and speaks through the word. God bless you, friends. Okay, I'm going to invite you back to your places. That includes you, Cindy, since you're on the worship team. So, yes. Uh, Welcome, everybody. I want to remind you of a couple of things as we begin our time of corporate worship together. Uh, I hope that you've had a good week and that you've had connection with the Lord. What makes this this experience different is that when the church comes together in a corporate gathering, the Holy Spirit is speaking to his church. And so I had just said to my friend Dave here, who's uh, playing the piano and will be helping with worship, that uh, I look forward to hearing what he has sensed and heard from the Spirit after we've had our time together. And I say to you, I want to encourage you to listen for the voice of God as we worship Him together. You you might be surprised what you hear from the Lord today. So as we gather in His presence, how about if we invite Him to speak to us? Would you pray that with me? Lord, we just take a moment as we're in your presence and we want to hear from you, Lord. But even in this, we need your help. We know that you could speak to us in a way that we understand. Lord, would you be so kind as to let us hear what the Spirit is saying. And would you give us courage to follow in that as we worship you in song and take time to read some scripture together. Lord, we're listening for your voice. And as we do, we offer to you honor and praise. So many other things in our world, Lord, call out for honor and praise, but we we give you that focus we give you this honor you and you alone are worthy of it because you are God Father and Son and Holy Spirit we worship you now as the one true God and the church said
I invite you to stand if you'd like to uh, for our time in worship. You're welcome to pray and worship at these altars at any point during this service as well. The Lord bless you, friends, as you worship. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing. favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. I may not face the lion, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. Oh, I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. Your
children then. You hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers way back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You moved in power then. God moved in power now. You are the same God. The same God, you were a healer then, you are a healer now, you are the same God, you are the same God, you were the Savior then, you are the Savior now, you are the same God, you are the same God. right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You touch the leopards then. I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the same Almighty river, come and fill me again. Come and fill me again. Come and fill me again. Isn't that just glorious to be able to sing about the God that is the same as he was in the stories we read in the Bible, he's still the same for us today. And I know Sean always says that we can hear the Lord speak in a way that we understand. And I know that one of the main messages, and we've talked about this recently, that God was giving throughout all the stories is that he's for us and that he loves us, that we're his beloved. And this next song we're going to sing is Blessed Assurance. When we know that the God that created us loves us and is for us, we have that assurance in life, in death. We can stay the course. We can keep going because of what Jesus did for us. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine heir of salvation purchase of God born of his spirit washed in his blood this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long this is my story my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his good lost in his love this is my story this is my song praising my 
As I uh, release the kids to go to Children's Church, I want to read to you a text that got sent uh, from Ellen and Shannon, the teachers down in Children's Church. This was the text that the parents got. Congratulations to our children in Children's Church. We've traveled all the way through the entire Old Testament, four weeks of Christmas lessons, four weeks of Easter's le Easter lessons, and now we begin the New Testament. Man, like, Shannon, you're getting it done. Why don't you just come up here and do, do what you do here? That, thank you. So we say thank you to you and Ellen. Well done. Really well done. Yeah. Man. Listen, I'm going to give you the option. If you want to go hear the word preached down there, you feel free, and it'll just be me and Diane. Diane, stay here. Um, <laughs> Uh, ushers, would you come forward and serve us, please? Let's just take a moment to, uh, uh, as we give in this way, to thank the Lord for the way in which he has provided for us. Maybe you have had a provision uh, that is financial or relational or just inspirational. But all of these blessings come from the Lord, the one who gives and as we give back, we do that in a spirit of worship. So let's begin this time of worship with thanksgiving. God, thank you. We recognize that you are faithful. And you've been faithful to us. Even when we waver, <laughs> Lord, you don't. You have not wavered in the way in which you've taken care of us. Thank you. We're asking, Lord, that you would take these gifts that we give from our finances, from our relationships, from our talents, that you would use them to bless others. And we ask for your blessing, Lord, as we offer ourselves to you in a new week of worship. Amen. The Lord bless you as you worship. Last week, I received a gift from a friend. It is a compass. And on the back of this compass is engraved this scripture in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. This friend that gave me this did not know that that scripture was my dad's very favorite scripture. And one of the very first that I learned as a little boy. Uh, my friend did also not know that I was beginning a short sermon series called Stay the Course. And compasses are designed for us to be able to find our way. Or if we're lost, to find it again. So I have just decided I'm going to have that with me for a while up here. So if I lose my place... Well, it won't help me find my place in my Bible, but it'll remind me where we're pointed. Where we're pointed as followers of Jesus. Where we're pointed as a church to our North Star, Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things vying for our attention, isn't there, in these days? 
and a lot of things that trouble us and could distract us from our direction and our eyes up and on Jesus. And so as we take some time this morning to look into the Word, I want to pray again. It's church. We can pray as much as we want and as much as we need. But I, I just want to say, let's, let's have our eyes up and our ears open for what the Spirit will say to us. Lord, we take this moment as we look into your word. We need you to be our teacher. We don't simply want to understand the history of the book. We want you to speak to us in the ways that you spoke to those that wrote down these words. We pray that you'd give us courage now as we receive and follow. And we pray for this with thanksgiving and expectation in the name of our Master Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to start in the Word, and it starts like this. Matthew chapter 4. It's along the, the shore of the sea. Jesus sees a couple of brothers. He's had contact with one of the brothers already, and he has intent of inviting these two fishermen to follow him, a traveling rabbi. It reads like this in Matthew 4, verse 18. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Now, the backstory of that is that Jesus had already met Andrew, and Andrew was almost immediately convinced upon meeting him that Jesus was this promised Messiah that his own parents had been teaching him and talking to him about. And Andrew had gone back to Peter and said, we, I have found the one. I met him. I met the Messiah. And as they were fishing one day and not having a whole lot of success, Jesus happened by after a long, unsuccessful night of fishing. And now some of you have had this experience because you fish. I never have this experience when I fish. Because when I fish, I go to Fred Meyer and I always come away with fish, if that's what I want. Actually, Diane does all of the fishing and the shopping and for us. But these guys, professional fishermen, had had a night where they got they struck out. They went over. And Jesus comes along and says, why don't you put your boat out a little further and toss your net out on the other side? And Peter, who had not yet met Jesus, was like, I kind of know what I'm doing. I, I know how to do this. Yeah. Yeah. But at your word, I'll do it. And then the boat almost sunk because they caught so many fish. And then Jesus says to them, why don't you boys follow me? I'll make you fishers of men. Right? And they do. Peter and Andrew join a, a small group of guys that start following Jesus. He followed him. These are some of the things that happened. Peter saw miracles. Peter saw Jesus heal lepers heal people who were blind, heal people who could not walk. Peter was witness to Jesus raising up someone who had died. He saw miracles. Then he performed miracles. Jesus gave him authority and power. He was part of a group that broke up a small loaf of bread, some bread and, and a little bit of fish, and fed thousands of people. The miracle went right through him. He was the distributor of this miraculous meal. It happened a couple of times. Peter walked on water, and I'm not talking water wings, faking it, like I used to when I was, a, you know, I'd run across, I'd run right off the edge of the swimming pool deck and, 
and then sink after about three steps or one. And I would say, I walked on water. Peter actually did it. Peter was witness to and experienced amazing things after he decided that he would follow Jesus. Some of you have had some amazing experiences in following Jesus. And some of you would say, I wish I could. But right in this room is representation of some miraculous things that you've either experienced or been a part of. Just like Peter. After Jesus said, follow me. One of the things that's captured my mind and attention over the last few years is this. Why is it that when some people start following Jesus, they don't finish the course? They don't stay the course. Now, in our time, there is a phenomenon called deconstruction. People who have begun in faith, but now are in the process of deconstructing from that faith. And it's not just Christian faith. It, it's a, it, we're in a season and in, in an interesting time time period in, in, in our world where faith is being, by some, deconstructed. Some people are hurt. And their hurt drives this decision to walk in a different direction. Some people are angry. And the anger is fueling the deconstruction. Some people have grown confused about what they once believed. And the confusion is what is behind this deconstruction. And it, you may be here. Don't, don't assume that just because you sit in a corporate worship service like this that everybody is in the same place. Because we're not. We're on a journey, right? A spiritual journey. If you're in a place where you have could relate to some of the things that I just said about deconstruction because of confusion or hurt or anger, you're welcome here because we're on a journey. And the hope is, by the strength of the Holy Spirit, we'll stay the course and finish in fact, when we were praying and singing songs, I, I had said right before that we started singing our worship songs, listen for what the Lord is saying to you. Now, I can't say that I had a word from God, but this thought came into my mind. God finishes what he starts. That thought came into my mind. And I thought, well, now I think that's true. And I think, I think, there's some scripture that backs that up. Jesus was described as being resolute. Like even when he was going to go to Jerusalem for the last time to a place where he'd already been threatened with arrest and there, it was known that there was a, a death threat on him, he said, I'm going to the place where it's most dangerous. And his disciples who had traveled with him for three years, tried to dissuade him. And they found him to be resolute. Like, no, boys, that's where I'm going. And one of the, one of the disciples, Thomas, said, well, let's go die with him then. They knew. They knew their master was not going to be turned away from finishing the race. So today, I want to look at the life of Peter. For in just maybe, maybe you've thought about these things. Maybe some of these thoughts will be new to you about his journey. Because you know where Peter was at? He got to a place after seeing all of the miracles, after being able to perform some of these miracles, being in Jesus' inner circle, 
he got to a place where he was going to make a decision of deconstructing and not finishing the course. Last week we looked at Judas. He he didn't finish the course, did he? He stumbled along the way. Now before, before he took his own life, Judas could say, I've sinned. I've betrayed an innocent man. But he didn't finish the course. And here, at what could be the end of all things, the death of Jesus, now Peter and the other disciples are facing a test that they have not yet faced. So we continue on in the story of Peter. We go back to the story of the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples. You remember that's where Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, and who is it, Lord, the one I dip the bread and give to? And and he did that to Judas, and and the other disciples totally missed it because Jesus sent him out, and they thought, oh, he's going to do something with the money because he's the guy in charge of the money, and the Lord's given him a task. They totally missed that Judas was the betrayer. At that same dinner, at that same time, this scripture was captured by Luke. It says this. Now it's at the dinner, and Jesus has just predicted that he'll be betrayed. Luke 22, starting in verse 23. The disciples began to ask each other which of them would ever do such a thing, meaning betray Jesus. Then they began to argue amongst themselves about who would be the greatest amongst them. Can we just pause there for a moment? Jesus has just dropped a bomb on them. I'm going to get betrayed and it's from one of you guys. Oh, who would do that? Would you do that? They go from, is it you, to, well, forget that. I'm I'm probably not going to do it because I'm the greatest amongst us. What a crew. Three years with Jesus, their last meal with them, (laughs) they get into a fight with one another about who's the greatest. Man, do you think Jesus was patient? I I, I think about some of these conversations that just make me shake my head. And I wonder what my mom and dad must have thought listening to their four boys at times. Like, June, I could hear my dad jack. June, let's start over. Let's just rent these guys out and start over. So they began to argue amongst themselves. Verse 25, Jesus told them, In this world the kings and great men lord it over their people. Yet... They, they call, let me read that again. Jesus told them, in this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people. Yet they call, they are called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest, notice he doesn't tell them which one is the greatest. Those that are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank and the leader should be like a servant. That's, that's a pretty good example of leadership in our day too, wouldn't it be? The ones who serve, they're the greatest leaders. Jesus goes on. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. For I am among you as one who serves. You have stayed with me in my time of trial. And just as the Father has granted me a kingdom, I now grant you the right to eat and drink at my table in in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, now he turns to Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. Well, that conversation took another turn, didn't it? 
They go from arguing about who's the greatest to having their master tell them, the one who's greatest is the one who serves, to, oh, uh, by the way, Simon, I've had a conversation with Satan. Oh, that's interesting. And he has asked to sift you and your compadres. Sift. That doesn't sound like a blessing. Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. I have pleaded with God that you would finish the race, that you wouldn't deconstruct, that you would hold, hold steady and hold to the course. I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even die with you. Can you tell that Peter's like, well, first of all, why are you singling me out? And I'm the leader of these guys. I'm ready to die with you. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you'll deny three times that you even know me. Peter saw the miracles. Peter performed the miracles. He was in Jesus' inner circle for three years. He would not have been the one that people would have suspected might not finish the course. They probably wouldn't have thought Peter's the guy whose faith is going to fail. And Jesus is giving him a heads up. Your course isn't done. It's not over. And it's about to become difficult. It might be that you're here this morning and you can relate to the warning that Jesus is giving Peter because you might be in a difficult time. You might know someone who is in a very difficult time, who is in fact being sifted by Satan. It's so easy when we're not in that situation to look and say, well, I'd never do that. I would never do that. You know how I know that? That's what happened at the dinner table with the disciples. One of you is going to betray me. Well, it's not me. Who is it? It's not me. I don't know. Well, I'm the greatest. It just, it just turns right to, it's not me. I'm not the one. We're made of the same stuff as those disciples. And if you're in a place where you feel like, ah, that's me. I'm getting sifted. I'm, I'm having a difficult time staying the course right now. You're not alone. You know what happened after Jesus said this? He went from that place where they had dinner, took his disciples to a place that he often went to pray, and as he was praying, his disciples, right there for him all the time, fell asleep. They, they weren't even able to stay awake and pray with him. It's described this way, that Jesus prayed with such fervency that he sweat drops of blood. He knew he was at the moment of greatest impact. He was being tempted and he even prayed, Lord, if there's a way for you to take this cup of suffering that I know is coming, take it. And then he yields and prays the prayer that we should celebrate every day, but not my will. Father, your will be done. And because he yielded to the will of the Father, we have free grace. We have the good news that by belief and faith in Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven of our sins. What, what would the options be if Jesus would have said, I really want my will on this one, Father. I really want my will. I don't want to drink from this cup of suffering. I wouldn't have 
anything that I could proclaim as good news. But it is good news because He chose the will of the Father. He is shortly after this arrested. And you know how the, the people who've come to arrest Him know who it is? Judas is with Him. He'd arranged a signal with the, the thugs that had come with Him. I'll give a kiss to the one that you need to arrest. That's the guy. That's Jesus of Nazareth. And then they take him away and they have a nighttime trial, which was against the law. And while Peter is warming himself by a fire outside of the place where Jesus is being held, he's asked, hey, aren't you one of those guys that was with you? I don't know him. No, I'm sure of it. I, I can hear your accent. You're one of the Galileans. I don't know him. I'm positive you're one of those guys that is with Jesus. I don't know him. And then, guess what happens? The rooster crows, and Peter is overwhelmed with grief and remorse and regret. And now he and Judas are in the same spot. One has betrayed an innocent man and one has denied his innocent friend. Jesus is crucified. He's resurrected. Maybe you're familiar with that part of the story. And then he begins over the next few weeks to appear to his disciples and a few hundred other people proving that he was alive. He'd even appeared to Peter. But at one point, Peter says to his buddies, I'm going fishing. Some scholars think that when he said that, it wasn't just, hey, you guys want it? We got a day off? Let's go fishing. But that he was so discouraged and he had not yet settled the denying of Jesus that he was really at on the razor's edge of his faith. What am I going to do here? I'm just going to go back to what I know. I'm going to go back to what I know. I'm going fishing. So some of his buddies go with him. And guess what happens? They're unsuccessful. I, I really wonder, how good were they in the first place? There's two stories where they don't catch anything. It's like, really boys, you couldn't have put in there? There's a lot of times I caught some stuff where Jesus wasn't around. But they go fishing again. They don't catch anything. And Jesus goes down on the beach, starts a fire, starts preparing some food for them, calls out to them, how's it going? Pretty tough night. We've been shut out again. Put the net on the other side. Who is that joker? I don't know. Put it. Boom. Boat almost sinks again. And what does Peter do? That's Jesus. See you, boys. Take care of the mess. And he gets out of the boat and goes to shore. The rest of them come in. They celebrate the massive catch. Jesus has prepared and served them breakfast. And then at the end of it, he says, uh, Pete, let's take a walk. And they walk down the beach a ways. And John follows, because John always wanted to be close to Jesus. And Jesus says this to Peter. Do you love me? Lord, I do. I love you. Feed my sheep. Jesus says to him again, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep. He asks him a third time as they're walking down the beach, Peter, do you love me? And it says there in John's Gospel, Peter was grieved because the Lord had asked him three times. Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. 
I, I like what I read in several commentaries, and it was this. Jesus got real intentional in Peter's restoration and healing. And for every denial, he gave him an opportunity to say, I love you. Man, the Lord, it, it, the Lord can be so personal with us, can He? But that wasn't the end of the conversation. Jesus says this to Peter in John 21, right after Peter has said for the third time, I love you. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to him, to Peter, to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. And then Jesus said, follow me. Which is the same thing that he'd said right at the start of their relationship. Follow me. When he said it at the first time, Peter followed him. That's where he got to see the miracles and perform the miracles and have time with Jesus. Then he denies him. He falls flat on his face. And Jesus brings him close. Gives him an opportunity to be healed and forgiven and restored. And then he says it again. Follow me. He did. And he, he did. He became the leader of the early church. From that point until the time that Peter died would have been roughly about three decades, 30 years. And in that time, Peter became the leader of the apostles and the leader of the church that was birthed at Pentecost. Mostly he stayed in Jerusalem, but eventually he made his way to Rome, where it's, it's historically thought that that's where he died, around 64 A.D., it's said that Peter was crucified. And I don't know if it's myth. There's, there's no specific history in this, but it's largely held that he was crucified, but he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel like he should have the same honor of dying in the way that his Lord had. But when Jesus said, there'll be a time when you get dressed by others and you're led to places you don't want to go, I, I would imagine that crucifixion would have been one of those places that he didn't want to go. But there he was in the early to mid-60s A.D. and he had stayed the course when there was a moment and he was deciding whether or not he would. When he was in Rome, he wrote, he wrote this to a young church, young Christians. He wrote this. Now, this had been about 30 years after Jesus had died. He wrote this. So be truly glad. There is a wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than gold. I'm going to pause there for a second. Listen, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, this is for you. Your faith in Jesus is more precious than gold. This is how the Lord receives that. It's you are precious to Him and your trust and faith in Him, your confidence in Him is precious as well. Though your faith is far more precious than gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, 
it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. You rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Wow. This from a guy who three decades earlier was trying to decide, am I going to go back to fishing and what I know? Or am I going to do what my master told me to do? To feed his sheep. Because this is feeding of the sheep. This is proof that he did it. Which is interesting because if you belong to Jesus and you receive those words, you've just been fed by the Holy Spirit through what Peter wrote. He wrote this at the end of that first letter that he wrote to these young Christians. In 1 Peter 5, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and at the right time, He will lift you up in honor. At the right time. Have you ever felt like you knew the right time and God had missed it? Lord, you're, you're, you're late. You're overdue. I can see it right here. You're overdue. Peter has learned. God ain't late. He writes, at the right time, He will lift you up in honor. Give all of your worries and cares to God, for He cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm. Stand firm against Him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Isn't it interesting? Now, 30 years later, after being told by the Master, Jesus, I've had a conversation with Satan. He's asked if he could sift you and your friends. Now, three decades later, He's come to understand what it means to be sifted. And he writes to a new generation of young Christians and says, your enemy prowls around like a lion, waiting and looking for whom he can devour. Or maybe sift. I used to watch... Uh, these nature programs with our son Zach when he was little. He loved to watch the nature programs. His sisters weren't so interested in watching wild animals tear one another apart, but he loved it. I mean, he was looking for animal body count or something, I guess, because we would watch these shows. And there would be some, and the zebra, unbeknownst to itself, is about to be eaten by the Serengeti lion, right? You can hear the voice. And you know, those, those animals that they eat, they might as well just have the word turbo printed on them. They're fast. Lions aren't fast over a long distance, over a long haul. You know what they need? They need tall grass that kind of looks the same color as them. And they prowl around looking for whom they can devour. And you know what I learned in those nature shows? The lions almost never take down the strongest one. It's one that's a little separated, maybe hurting in some way. That's the one that they call out and end up attacking, taking down, and devouring. And Peter was saying, that's Satan. That's how he works. And he wants to take you down. Remember, your family all around the world is experiencing the same thing. 
this phenomenon uh, that's now being called deconstruction, it's not new. Satan has been setting himself against the followers of Jesus since the beginning. We just have a new way of describing it. And it may seem like it's more of a flood than a trickle. And you know what? The church should be the last place that chides or demeans somebody who is struggling with their faith. And yet, so often that happens. And so often it's not the church that people feel like they could be a part of. The church is not a building. It's, a, it's the gathering of those who are followers of Jesus. Because you know what could happen if you're not wavering? It could be your turn to be prowled against and to be sought out for sifting. This is happening across the world for those that are followers of Jesus. And Peter says, hang on, for a little while these trials will endure. But your master, keep your eyes on him. So Peter gets a chance to speak to those in a way that Jesus spoke to him. Do you love me? I, I do. Do you love me? Lord, you know I do. But I'm struggling. I know. I know. Let's walk and talk. Let's, let's process this out. Because if somebody will walk alongside you or me in a time when we're being sifted, just say, listening, not condemning, encouraging, and saying, I love you, the Lord loves you. Stay the course. Don't give up. He is worthy. He'll provide. This won't last forever. There's something beyond this life. Stay the course. I'll stay with you. How about those messages? Then, then we become to those who might be in a difficult time, what Jesus was to Peter. I don't think Jesus took any joy in the knowledge that his friend Judas took his own life. None. I'm going to close our time in the Word. And uh, I'm just going to ask for Diane and Cindy and Dave, if you would just allow me to close the service with this scripture. We, we had planned a song, my apologies to our team who thank you for your service to us. But I, I want to read this scripture and pray. And then we'll close our time together. This is from Paul, the Apostle Paul. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Um... I learned a song. I can't believe I'm about to do this, but I, I learned a song from this verse. So I guess we are going to say, I'm going to sing. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Stand firm, stand firm. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, for you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain, for 
you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Jesus is worth it. Stay the course. Don't give up. He sees you. You are precious to Him. Your faith is precious to Him. Lord, as we close our time today, we thank You for Your faithfulness to us. Thank You for helping us when the way is difficult. I ask, Lord, for any that might be hearing what I've said, that You would encourage them if they're angry or hurt or confused. That You would encourage them the way that You encouraged Peter. Lord, I pray that You would use us maybe as hands or feet or voice, so that we could come alongside others the way you came alongside Peter. So that we could stand firm and stay the course and finish this race. We need you, God. We love you. We, we love you. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Amen. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give to you his complete peace. You are dearly loved, friend. Go in the name and the strength of Jesus. God bless you. You're dismissed.